Welcome everyone, I'm Asha Dyer and I am thrilled to be hosting this very timely and important panel today. I feel like I'm saying timely and important a lot these days, but for anyone who's paying attention to what is currently happening, happening with regard to abortion access in the United States right now, the rabid pace of horrendously regressive copycat abortion restrictions being passed at a state level, I feel like those two words are altogether accurate which is why we're here today and why conversations like the one I'm about to have with my guests are so vital. First up, I wanna mention that this panel is presented in partnership with Repro Film and IFC Films. Through film and conversation, Repro advocates for reproductive health, justice, and bodily autonomy. We lift intersectional issues using the power of storytelling as a catalyst for knowledge, intention, and action. Joining me today is award-winning filmmaker Audrey Diwan, who is the director of Happening, based on the 2000 novel of the same name by Annie Ernaux. The film won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival in 2021 and has been receiving universal acclaim from critics worldwide, very well deserved. The film takes place in France in the 1960s when abortion was illegal. Anne is a bright young student with a promising future ahead of her. But when she falls pregnant, she sees the opportunity to finish her studies and escape the constraints of her social background disappearing. With her final exams approaching and her belly growing, Anne resolves to act even if she has to confront shame and pain, even if she must risk prison to do so. It is a must watch film, especially right now. I will also be joined by Rebecca Tong, who is the co-executive director of the Trust Women Clinics and has been since 2013, and Steph Herald, a researcher who studies the portrayal of abortion on television and film as part of the abortion on screen team over at the University of California, San Francisco. Today's conversation will delve into the impact of abortion stories on screen, how what we see in film and TV can help us engage with what is happening in real life, and how abortion stories can inform either our progress or regression when it comes to abortion access. IFC Films will release Happening in New York and Los Angeles on May 6th, nationwide on May 13, and everywhere you rent movies, June 21, so stay tuned. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Audrey Dewan, Rebecca Tong, and Steph Harold. Hello, wonderful panelists. Hello, nice to meet Hi. you. Thanks for having us. Well, first I wanna say a huge thank you to all of you for joining me today. I know we're all in different time zones and different parts of the world, which is what I love about doing virtual panels. And it truly is an honor to be speaking with you. It is also important to mention that at the time of this recording, we have just found out from a leaked memo last night that the Supreme Court will be overturning Roe versus Wade in a ruling on the very important Dobbs v. Jackson case. It is the result many of us expected, but it is extremely devastating nonetheless. So of course I had to revise my Q&A a little bit and thought process to reflect current events, but I'm really glad for the opportunity to be talking with you all as experts in your respective fields. Um, but with all of that as the emotional backdrop for this conversation, my first question I wanna throw over to Rebecca as the co-executive director of Trust Women Clinics, which operate in Oklahoma and Kansas, how are you and your staff feeling right now in the middle of all of this? Um, we've had a long time to come to fruition with this reality. So it is something that we anticipated and we're expecting. Um, it is still, you know, devastating to see. And um, I think we're all thinking of our patients and the people that we will be unable to help in the future. Um, because of this reversal. So um, today our clinics are still open, um, access to abortion remains available. And once it does go away, um, we will not abandon these areas of our country and the people here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the work you're doing. It's so important right now. And I know you've been seeing an influx of patients from Texas ever since the six week ban remained in effect from the end of last year. What does the future look like for abortion clinics and abortion access to, you know, for people who are seeking this help right now? 
and in the future? Um, so in Oklahoma, there is a trigger law set to go into place. So we do anticipate that access in Oklahoma will be no more once the Supreme Court comes out with its final decision. Uh, in Kansas, we do have a state constitutional protection. It's up for a vote this August, but as of right now, it is um, it protects the right above and beyond federal protections. So um, we get to deal with a mixed bag of things where we're gonna continue to provide services and increase services in Kansas as we reduce abortion services in Oklahoma. We won't do so until absolutely the last moment necessary, but that is a path that we are navigating. And um, I think this film, it was, even just the trailer was, um, I was really scared to be quite honest. It played like a horror film trailer um, because I, we understand very viscerally the desperation that people are driven to in order to not remain pregnant. Absolutely. And speaking of the film, Audrey, congratulations on all the accolades you've been receiving for happening. All very well deserved. I felt, I mean, I, I felt like I was, clenching in so many moments during the film and it's so visceral what kind of reactions have you been getting from audiences globally but especially here in the U.S. right now um you know okay a friend of mine sent me a text very early this morning telling me in Paris where I live what was going on in your country so I'm a bit tired because I was so sad. So I woke up very early in the morning thinking about the girl I met in Oklahoma, uh, in Atlanta, sorry. So I went from New York to San Francisco, to Los Angeles, to Atlanta. But of course, the last destination in Atlanta, it was different because those girls told me this could be us. So we could be the girl. And uh, I, I kept thinking about those young girls who says those who says those words? You know that that could be our story, and it's it, it's something to write fiction. It's something to ask questions to reality. It's, it's something to want people to ask themselves questions, and it's something else seeing this being reality for girls. You know, so absolutely. What inspired you to make the film in the first place? Um. I had an abortion myself and I wasn't planning on making a film at all on the topic. I just wanted to read something that would help me think about it. And I've been reading Aniano for years, the writer, and it's her story because she basically writes only autobiographical stories. Um, but then when I read, I realized my lack of knowledge. Like I grew up thinking about illegal abortion, but I had no idea. So I compared the two experiences, the one I had, medicalized legal abortion, and I can, then, I can tell you one thing. The first thing that I had in mind is that medical abortion is different in one way to me, is that it goes through a routine. Whereas when you go to illegal abortion, it's only about random. Who you're gonna meet, who's gonna help or not help, or turn you to the police, are you going to end, end, end up in jail in an hospital, survive or not. And, and I read the, the book as a, as a very intimate thriller, thinking that the, this random was unbearable. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for sharing part of your personal story too. Abortion storytelling is so powerful and definitely changing the landscape. And speaking of which, Steph, I'd love for you to talk about your team at UCSF and why you decided to make these reports on abortion on screen and perhaps talk about what we may see in future storylines given the news that we heard from the, uh, the Supreme Court leak yesterday. You know, we hear a lot about The Handmaid's Tale, but what's the more realistic picture that you can paint for us? Sure. Um, so my team, um, Dr. Gretchen Sisson and I, we study depictions of abortion on television and film. Um, and Gretchen and my colleagues started about a decade ago um, really wrestling with this common perception that abortion is not relative is not uh, often depicted on film or or on television, and she wondered if that was really the case. 
Um, so she uh, studied every depiction she could find um, and actually found that both television and film have a long history of portraying abortion um, and, and going back, you know, a hundred years to the beginning of film and going wow. back, you know, to the middle of 20th century uh, to the beginning of television. And what's really troubling is how abortion has been portrayed. Right. So on television, it's about 30 times riskier to have an abortion than it is in real life. Um, on, uh, on television, if someone needs an abortion, they can often get it right away. When in real life, um, we know that there are almost insurmountable barriers to abortion access that people face. Um, on television and on film, most of the people who, have, who access abortions are white, are young, are not parenting, have no trouble getting money towards the cost of the abortion, or money isn't even an issue. Um, right, and in real life, that's not the case at all. Um, often most people need help coming up with the money towards the cost of the abortion. Um, they're women of color, they're parenting, they're living close to the poverty line. Um, so there are just really big discrepancies that we see even though abortion is portrayed quite frequently. Um, so that's really the through line of our research. It really shows the, the powerful impact abortion on screen can have and how it relates to real life. What would you say has been the most surprising result about the study, um, the, the studies that you've been doing since the reports began and potentially how have these storylines reflected what's been happening specifically in, in the US over the past few years or decade even? Yeah, so I think one of, the, one of the big themes and shifts we've noticed over the last 10 years in particular is a change in where the conflict is happening in plot lines on both film and television. Um, it used to really be that when a character uh, was thinking about having an abortion, the conflict really centered around her decision making, right? Mm -hmm. So will she or won't she get an abortion? What will the other characters think? Who's going to try to convince her out of it? Um, or you had a character who decided to get an abortion and then had this kind of convenient miscarriage on the way to the clinic or ended up changing her mind, right? Some kind of classic examples of that are Juno or Knocked Up. Um, it's movies that you know, feel very contemporary, but actually were a decade or more ago. Yeah. Um, but now we see a lot more focus on what it actually takes to get the, to get the abortion. That's where the conflict is, um, very much like in Happening, right? So in, tw in 2020, there were these two films, um, or three films actually, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, Unpregnant, and Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Um, which actually focused much less on, you know, the will they or won't they get the abortion, but more how are they going to get the abortion? Here are all the obstacles they have to overcome to get the abortion. Um, mm -hmm. Same with this film Little Woods in 2019, which focused on how difficult it is to access healthcare, period, in the U.S. Um, another film um, in 2015 um, was Grandma, starring Lily Tomlin. Um, it was about a grandmother who helps her granddaughter uh, raise the money towards the cost of the abortion. Um, so that's a really big shift we're seeing. Um, but even though we're seeing, you know, uh, more representation of these barriers, it's really still missing from television in particular. Like we see these kind of dramatic narratives about travel, um, but we don't see a lot of the mundane compounding barriers, right? The, the withholding of insurance coverage, the waiting periods, the, have to, the having to miss work, um, the gestational bans that close clinics, all of those things that happen in reality, even though they can make for really dramatic film and television, we don't often see that. Um, usually when there's a barrier to abortion access on TV or film, the character can overcome it. Um, and part of what was so striking to me about happening and so different was that you really see and you know her her desperation and determination to overcome barrier after barrier that is thrown at her. Right, it's not just that abortion is illegal; it's that her friends abandon her, a doctor misleads her, uh, the provider that she eventually finds uh, the abortion doesn't work. She tries to do the abortion herself; it doesn't work. Um, so those kind of like compounding factors, I think, give us a better sense of, um, you know, those twin desperation and determination factors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's just so much in there that you spoke about, you know, those barriers that I really hope will be explored more in, in storylines. And it's just, I mean, I'm still trying to form the words about, you know, what we're going to see from here on out with the reality of abortion access and how you know film can impact that. Um, Audrey, I want to mention there's, there's parts of the film where it almost feels like you're in a documentary watching someone in the 1960s trying to navigate that path, you know, to get access to abortion. You know, there's the scene where she tries to do it herself and 
there's not a lot of music musical cues but you feel you're right there with her going through those emotions can you talk a little bit about the creative decisions behind some of those scenes where you didn't use music but you knew that the audience would feel the emotion of what she's going through in that moment you know it's a true story so and and then yeah know what i love about her work is that she really tries to get to what her memories was not trying to create any legend to make herself look bright or better it's only the truth she tries to get as close at the truth as she could so when i got to her talking about adapting the book i said of course i i can't go nearby close to your memories i'm, I'm gonna make fiction but i will try to be close to an experience like a physical experience and my only concern was in order to make a movie that is meaningful to me is like uh, what if we are not looking watching her, uh, her but try to be her so let's use movie as a sharing experience and i mean i grew up like this you know watching movies sharing experience that were not mine and then i changed my it changed my mind and it changed the way I looking at the world and I, I deeply uh, believe that art is for that purpose too you know we can actually be her whereas we're women men any gender I mean I was trying to, to work and write beyond gender to see okay it is something to talk about abortion and even I I had ideas it, whereas you're you're pro or against abortion you you are actually talking about it and you are also talking about illegal abortion the thing is, we don't know what it is. And I realized reading the book, okay, I had no idea what is the experience of, the, of, the, of a woman when she's not allowed to. So what if I try to share that and I use different you know, dimensions of movie, the sound, the frame. Uh, and first, when I was reading the book, I, I was asking myself, what if I had a camera recorder in the 60s because I know that it's a nowadays story. So it's the reason why when you mentioned documentary, it's, I have an inner smile because I was asking myself this question. What if I could have been with her, try to understand what it was to be in France 1963? And of course, I played it knowing, unfortunately, that it was a nowadays story in so many countries. Except I, I had no idea it would be your, your story in America. Hmm. Right. And speaking of our story in America, Rebecca, I, I want to talk to you about how, you know, there have been, there has been a lot of complacency specifically within pro-choice democratic leadership, um, maybe amongst the wider pro-choice community, not necessarily activists and leaders, because those are the people who have been sounding the alarm for more than a decade now, clinics, activists, um, spokespeople, journalists. Can you tell us what the realities of abortion access will look like beyond this, this ruling in the case? Like, are we going to see what happened in the 60s pre-Row? Is it going to be a little bit different? Can you, can you lay out some of the realities for us? Yeah, um, there will be similarities and there will be differences. Um, medicine has come a long way. And there are many safe methods for self-managed abortion. Um, unfortunately, in many of the parts of our country where they're going to make abortion illegal, they're also going to criminalize self-managed abortion and criminalize pregnancy, I'm sorry, abortion and um, unwanted pregnancies. Right. So um, right now, the number one barrier in our region towards accessing an abortion is getting an appointment. Um, it is not easy to reach us right now, um, even while it remains legal, right? You have to call multiple times. People are being delayed at least two weeks across the board. And this is leading to higher risk pregnancies, um, more medical complications, more surgical procedures, um, and this, like so much in our world disproportionately falls on um, people who fall through the cracks in our society. Um, people who have very low access to healthcare period where our appointment with them might be their first doctor's appointment in years. Wow. Um, I think something that I definitely connected with in this film and I think for our patients is 
um, this is not a decision made flippantly, right? Um, this is um, a complex decision people make for a complex set of circumstances in their lives. And a lot of times I think the general public asks, well, why did they wait? Why did they wait so long to get an abortion? It's not on purpose, right? Um, it is not because they wanted to be delayed. And unfortunately, with the, the stigma and shame surrounding abortion, and the further into pregnancy you are, the more shame, the more stigma. And so our patients come and they are just wound up with stress of having spent weeks trying to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. And they feel guilty um, because they've been told by society that they should feel guilty, right? When the people confronted her in that bathroom, um, when her dorm mates confronted her. Yeah, um, yeah the, right? How dare you shameful woman have sex and get pregnant and think that you should have control over the course and direction of your life. Can um, I just add uh, that? I do agree with you, but also in reality, and that's my only hope regarding what you might go through. And I talked about it with a lady who actually went and had this story. Um, at the end, she's helped by the, the women that were against because at a very crucial moment, we are all humans. And it's something to be against abortion, theoretically. And it's something else than to be in front of a girl almost dying. And what side of this line you're gonna be and what you decide and what you'll do. And once again, it's true stories, you know. Let's see who we're going to be. Let's not be too theoretical because I think we all have ideas. And once again, I, I'm not making movies in order to tell people what to think, you know. But when you are in front of that reality, you might have to, 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 to shift your viewpoint because something else goes beyond, you know. I hear a lot of people talking about hearts, you know, and, uh, and the way it beats. Of course, there is a girl with a beating heart and she's almost dying. We should think about that. It's where you put your eyes, actually. It's like I, I often think of, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the saying, Renee Bracey Sherman from We Testify, the founder of We Testify, says everybody loves someone who's had an abortion or who has had abortions. And that's the reality. It's not good abortions or bad abortions. It's we're all familiar with this issue whether we've had them ourselves or we know someone, that's that's the reality. Um, Rebecca, I'd love you to clarify what self-managed abortion is for people who are unfamiliar and what that might involve and, and what the current law is, um, if you can speak about that. Yeah, um, the medication abortion, so it's two sets of medication. Um, at our facilities, you take one set with the physician and you take several sets ho at home later on. And it uh, basically induces a miscarriage. And so um, these medications are perfectly safe to self-administer. Um, they can be, you know, again, could be prescribed by a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant, et cetera, um, and can easily be mailed to you. Um, state legislatures have moved specifically to block that. So um, in Kansas and in Oklahoma, it is not legal for medications to be, abortion medications to be mailed. Um, in many states, if you take medications that induce a miscarriage, um, you could be prosecuted. And lo and behold, whom did they prosecute in our world, right? Um, again, this disproportionately falls on low-income women of color, undocumented people. Um, that we're already happy to criminalize as a society. Um, so many people right now, even in Texas, I am sure, you know, we know have been receiving medications through the mail, over the internet, um, et cetera. And um, every so often, some of them will get nervous and go to the ER. And we're gonna see people butting up against traditional healthcare systems and all it takes is one overzealous prosecutor. Um, we just saw this recently in Texas 
where a nurse reported a woman at the hospital for inducing a miscarriage and they later dropped the charges, but everybody knows, right, that she tried to induce an abortion. Everybody knows her private medical business in a small town. Um, So her, her story, her life is forever changed because of that. It's just so terrifying to think that you want to trust people within the medical system, but that's often where we see the reporting happening. And that was the story of Lizelle Herrera you mentioned in Texas. Um, Very, very, just a very devastating and shocking case for her. Like you said, it should have been private. Now her business is out in the world. Um, Steph, I want to ask you, um, one of the most common things we read about that I've been reading about and hearing about from, you know, a lot of journalists and researchers and experts in this field is the importance of accurate portrayals, like you mentioned before, which the happening, which Audrey Film does really, really well. You know, you see the reality of abortion access pre-legality in, in France. Can you talk about the connection between realistic portrayals on screen and how this can, a realistic or unrealistic actually, and how this can impact people's perceptions and attitudes toward abortion? Sure. So TV and and film, like we've been talking about, um, really help people make sense of the world, right? Like God was saying, they can can give people empathy towards something they hadn't thought about before. Um, It's really important for us to know what messages the media are conveying about abortion, um, particularly now when it's such a politically precarious and frankly awful moment for abortion rights here in the U.S. Um, We know that the, the general public knows relatively little about abortion, Um, research finds that people often believe, you know, many common myths about abortion, including that it's rare when it's actually very common, um, but it's medically risky when it's actually very safe. Um, And many people believe that it's relatively easy to obtain an abortion when we know it's actually quite difficult. Um, Most people also don't know about abortion laws and abortion restrictions in their own communities. Um, And television and film can really address and challenge this misinformation. It uh, can give audiences a glimpse into who gets an abortion, who provides abortions, um, what that experience is like, how you can support someone through an abortion. Um, because abortion is so stigmatized, lots of people don't disclose their abortions to friends, right, as we were talking about, um, or family, especially if they're worried about being judged. Um, so as a result, lots of people don't know that they have loved ones who have abortions, um, or that they don't know that abortion can, can affect anyone, um, and everyone, all of us, right? Um, so seeing characters have abortion on television, especially, and in film, especially characters that you come to know and love, um, could be the first time someone really sees abortion as a personal issue, not just a political lightning rod, right, um, which can in turn impact not just how they understand abortion, but their position on abortion in general. Um, we're working to kind of untangle the causal mechanisms there in our research. So. Um, in 2019, we studied the effect of this one particular plot line on Grey's Anatomy, um, where a woman, um, this character, Cassie, tries to induce an abortion with parsley tea, um, and it doesn't work, and she ends up going to the hospital uh, and having a medication abortion. Um, so we found that, you know, after watching this, people's knowledge about medication abortion significantly increased, just not surprising because one of the doctors on the show kind of verbatim gives the accurate medication abortion protocol. Um, but that their increased knowledge about abortion did not translate into more support for abortion in general, right? They didn't extrapolate that, you know, the mom they were seeing on screen might be a mom that they know or their own mom, for example. Um, So it might be that people really need to see many different portrayals of abortion across different shows, across different films um, and significant ones, right? Not just kind of like a blip. Um, one time um, to really move people um, when it comes to abortion. So it's it's really something that's important. It still blows my mind that there's so much l- people who don't know the reality of abortion access or, um, you know, there are people who still think in some states it already is a- illegal. And so it just really shows the power of shame and stigma and, and, and what a job that has done, keeping people silent. So it's really, really... I, I really see such a cultural shift now with more abortion storytelling, more storylines happening on screen and, and activist, activism and workshops and sit-ins and, and rallies. I think that's just so, so powerful and really changing the culture. Um, similar to the way abortion became legal federally here in 1973 under Roe, in France it was legalized in 1975. 
It should also be noted that mifepristone, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, could be my bad Australian pronunciation, the drug used in a medication abortion originated in France in the 1980s. So there's another connection with uh, your home country, Audrey. Um, Audrey, can you tell us more about the history of clandestine abortion services in France that you researched for the film? How did women find out about this before it was legal? Uh, actually, the most of the time they didn't find how to get an abortion and they tried it themselves. I mean, I'm not talking, the story doesn't take place in Paris, neither in a, in a, in a big city. And it's a story of girls, I mean, the, 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 the girl I portray lives in the, she's come from, uh, from working class and she's from a, a small town and she has no clue and she doesn't have any help. And by the way, I mean, if, if there is one better thing now is that we have internet. I mean, I'm talking about a moment when you don't even know what's going on in your own body, you know, so, um, so I say it's, uh, uh, it's only random. Like you try to tell people and see if there is anyone who's going to help you, you know, and it's just chance or bad luck. And it's crazy oh, to risk as well. It, seemed, it was yeah. very risky for her. And it's crazy to think about that story this way, but it is. And you know, it's uh, it's very interesting because when I talked with Annie Erno, she told, she, and to me that was the story of the book. She's a girl looking for freedom. I mean, I never intended, to be honest, to make a, a movie about illegal abortion. I was in love with the character of this young girl, like 22. She comes from a working class. She wants to go to university and she has sexual desire, but she talks about it. She has intellectual desire and she's ready to say it out loud. She wants to say out loud that one day she'll be a writer. And it's unexpected from a girl of 22 years old uh, in, in the countryside in France. And on her way to that freedom, on, on her quest, she has to get an illegal abortion. And that's the way I portrayed it. That's the way she told me it was. And it's any girl who actually has ambitions and dreams and, you know, a way to go. And she said to me something that actually sounds like a, a sentence I put in the movie. I want a kid, but uh, I want a child someday, but not a child instead of a life. And actually she had kids after all, you know, but she was ready and she loved them and she fulfilled what they need. And it's just a, a woman looking for freedom, which we should be able to have someday, you know. Yeah. What do you want audiences to think about most after watching happening? What do you want them? Do you want them to take action in some way? What do you want them to feel? Uh, I actually ask nothing to anybody. I want everybody who watched the film to ask and felt, find their own question. I can tell you my own question. As a human being, can I deal with that level of pain? Can I accept this idea that when, abor when abortion goes illegal, uh, then the woman try when you're not allowed to have legal abortion, you go illegal. I mean, it's not even a question whereas there will or will not be legal abortion. When it's not legal, then women are doing it illegal. So we all know that the results, and we know through decades that the, the, the results is that women are going to go that way. So as human beings, can I, as a human being, can I agree with the idea that a woman is going through that journey? That is my question. And all I do is showing a reality. I'm not even trying to be shocking. Reality is shocking, my movie is not. I mean, I never put my camera very, a very long time showing shocking pictures, you know? I just try to portray reality the way it is in the first way. And then everyone has to deal with their own questions. But at least this moment, we need to ask ourselves questions, you know, what is abortion, what is illegal abortion, and where are we regarding that pain and that loneliness, by the way. I love that, encouraging people to ask those questions, really thinking about this as a, the reality now, uh, globally, um, and especially here in the US. Steph, as, as films can have a major impact, as we've talked about on the way we think about many topics, what do you want audiences in the US to think about or take action after watching um, happening? And where can people get in touch and follow more of your work and see the reports? Sure, um, I just wanna just reiterate what Audrey said because I think that's so so important that you know this film isn't shocking. It's a reality that's shocking. It's 
you know, recriminalizing abortion, that's what's shocking. Denying people access to health care, that's what's shocking. Um, I was talking to a journalist about this film and she said, you know, oh, it made me a little bit squeamish, like it's so visceral. Um, and I was really thinking about that and just hearing Audrey, you talk about it. Um, it's a really helpful reframe. Like, have you seen, like I've given birth twice and that, you know, was pretty visceral and <laughs> quite, um, <laughs> would make some people quite squeamish. Uh, if you show that on camera. Um, so I think that's just really important to, to put in that context. Um, so thank you for that. Um, um, to get to your question, um, I think the film does really an incredible job of showcasing the, the lengths to which a person will go to when they're determined to get an abortion, right? And as Rebecca was saying, this is the world we're, we're living in now. And it looks like, you know, it will only get worse from here, depending on, you know, what the Supreme Court does with this, you know, draft decision. That, was leaked yesterday. Um, so I think it's what's really crucial, part of what's really crucial to take away is, you know, once you want an abortion, you want an abortion and you have the right to have a safe, stigma-free, loving abortion. And what, you know, what I think I would want people to take away is that barriers to abortion, whether it's illegality or insurance that withholds coverage to abortion or gestational bans, it's, it's the barriers to abortion that are harmful, right? No matter what decade we're in. Um, that happening is a historical film, and yet many people today need help navigating obstacles that make abortion um, impossible to access, right? Our communities should be able to get the abortions that we need without shame, without these restrictions, um, without any outside interference. Um, and that abortion is safe and, and common, and you should be able to have one with love and with support. Very well said. Thank you for that. And and where can people follow more of your work? And oh, research? sure. Um, um, abortiononscreen.org. That's where our database is. We actually try to um, monitor and track and analyze every depiction of abortion across film and television. So we have over 500 examples of plot lines um, oh, over the last 100 years. Um, that's where you can find our work. And that's where you can also find um, our, I think, almost a dozen published studies at this point. Um, and I'm also on Twitter at, at Steph Harold and answer is also on Twitter at, at A N S I R H answer. Yeah. We'll put all the links, um, all the relevant links and share with people so they can check it out. And the reports are really fascinating. I really fascinating. I really encourage people to look at them. And finally, Rebecca, how can viewers support trust women and abortion access right now? Where can they go to find more information? encourage everyone to, um, yeah, look, people don't think about abortion until they need one. So look into who your local abortion provider is and what ways can you help people access the care that they, they know that they need, right? You can make it illegal. I mean, that will not get rid of it. I, I love how Audrey put it, that this was about her freedom, right? The character's mm -hmm. freedom. Um, the number one reason that people come to our clinic self-reported, the number one reason is that they want to be a good parent. They wanna be a good parent in the future or they wanna be a good parent for the children that they already have. There are so many wonderful, moral, important reasons that people access abortion care. And um, I love that this film helps us to look at the person who needs that help to not turn away from them in this moment. And so, um, yeah, I, I would encourage everyone to really look at who is it that needs abortions, right? Who gets abortions? People who have sex, that's it. Um, and what should they have to go through? Should it be this harrowing? Should they have to overcome all of these obstacles? Um, these are responsible people trying to get by in life. And there are not, you know, for abortion and for all healthcare, there are so many barriers. Um, so thank you so much for making this film, for not making it over the top. Um, you know, one thing our patients always say to us, which is heartbreaking because they still come to the clinic, right? They say, you all are so nice, or it's so clean in here. Um, you provide such great health care. And they came thinking they were going to get maimed, that somebody was going to hurt them, 
but they came anyway because they knew they could not be pregnant any longer. Right. Well, thank you so much for the work you're doing and, and how can people get in touch with Trust Women given that you have so many wait times right now and there are so many people trying to get in touch with you, what would you recommend? Please visit our website, trustwomen.org and there are resources up there and we will be adding to them and giving people more information as this, you know, the ground underneath us shifts. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you all, all of these wonderful panelists for joining me today. I know it's a terrifying and uncertain time for so many. So thank you all for the work you're doing. As I mentioned at the beginning, ISC Films will release happening in New York and LA on May 6th nationwide May 13 and everywhere you rent movies on June 21 so be on the lookout and if you're in Wichita Kansas join us for an advanced screening of happening at the Wichita Art Museum on May 11 in partnership with Trust Women. Don't forget to sign up for the Repro Film Periodical a free monthly newsletter available via email and online each issue centers a topic under the general reproductive health and justice banner and includes a curated short film an original interview podcast featuring storytellers and activists hosted by me, as well as articles and links to advocacy organizations. Head to reprofilm.org to sign up. And lastly, thank you everyone for watching this panel and please do follow the work of the panelists, continue to fight for abortion access and bodily autonomy for everyone, everyone who deserves it. Everybody loves someone who's had an abortion, as they say at We Testify, and that's the reality. So. Thank you everyone for joining me today and we'll see you at the next Repro Film panel. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Asha. Thank you so much.